قال الله تعالى في محكم كتابه الكريم وقوله الحق وهو أصدق الصادقين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محصنين غير مسافحين فما استمتعتم به منهن فآتوهن أجورهن Bless this gathering and your gathering with a remembrance upon Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. As a gift to the soul of Sayyidina wa Mawlana Amir al Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib recite the second salawat. And this beloved night, and this blessed night, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to shower onto the graves of all the mu'mineen and mu'minat with His mercy and compassion and to hasten the reappearance of Sayyidina wa Mawlana, Sahib al Asr wa Zaman, bi barakati al Salati ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad bi a'la aswatikum. It is indeed the most misunderstood, the most misused form of marriage within the religion of Islam. Some believe it is legitimate, some believe it is a form of fornication. Some believe it's a form of prostitution and some believe it's a blessing from God. Temporary marriage, timed marriage, mut'ah, or as some people call it, temp, is one of the most taboo subject matters within our community. While media outlets such as BBC and the likes spend millions upon millions of dollars creating documentaries and films to defame the Ithna Ashari school of thought, we choose to ignore this topic. We choose to remain silent when it comes to discussing this matter. Temporary marriage is a form of valid marriage within the religion of Islam amongst two consenting adults. However, that is not the only thing that we should discuss when it comes to this practice amongst Muslims all around the world. And tonight, my respected brothers, my respected sisters, my friends, we are not here to discuss whether this is something that you should be doing. 
We are not here to encourage you to do this, nor we are here to discourage you to do this. Because I believe that this is a personal opinion of people. But we are here to ask an extremely important question. This question will be the road map for our discussions for the next five nights, insha'Allah. And it's much bigger than temporary marriage. This question that we're about to introduce right now to our audience is an extremely fundamental question within the heart of the religion of Islam today in the year 2022 around the world. And that is, that is it appropriate for such a noble institution to be discussing such matters, especially on such a holy night, in such a holy place, Is it appropriate for the member to be discussing such issues? Is it okay for us to discuss taboos from a member dedicated to Rasulullah, to the religion of Islam, on a night like this to the commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen wa Mawla al-Muhaddeen Ali ibn Abi Talib salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. And the answer is embedded within the life and the legacy of Amir al-Mu'mineen and his devout, his loyal, his most beloved companions who were known as Hawariyun al-Amir al-Mu'mineen. And insha'Allah in one of the nights I will be discussing the role of the Hawariyun of Amir al Mu'mineen and the Shi'i legacy and the survival of Shi'ism. So today we're going to tie the discussion tonight with the discussion on the very last night of our series. It begins with the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen and the role and it ends with the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen and the role. And I wanted to define this, this very moment. Create a road map for everybody. Amir al-Mu'mineen had a set of companions known as Hawariyun Ali ibn Abi Talib. Just like Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus the son of Mary had disciples, Hawariyun. Amir al-Mu'mineen also has Hawariyun, his disciples. So on a night like this, we go to the legacy of his disciples. Naqdad, Salman, Ammar, Abu Dhar, Malik, Al-Ashtar al-Nakha'i, Adi al-Kindi. We look at his legacy. We look at their legacy and we ask this question. Did they discuss taboos? Did they discuss things that others were not willing to discuss? If you look at the life of Amir al-Mu'mineen and his companions, you see their entire life, the school of Amir al-Mu'mineen, graduated individuals, who are willing to step out of their comfort zones. Who are willing to discuss things that others were not willing to discuss. Who were willing to do things that others chose not to do. This was their task in life. And at many times people would go to them. They would say to the people who, they, who loved them. Who appreciated them. Who honored them. They would go to them and they would tell them, please don't say those things. Please don't discuss such things. You may have to pay a heavy price for this, including your honorable lives. Muhammad ibn al-Hanafiya, the son of Amir al-Mu'mineen, writes to his imam, to his brother, al-Husayn ibn Ali, he says to him, Ya Husayn, 
I love you. I honor you. Please do not leave Medina. Do not embark on this journey. He advised him. This was the advice coming from people. To Imam al Hussein, to Amir al Mu'mineen, to Ammar, to Miqdad, to Maytham al Tamar, who lost his life, who gave his entire life just because he spoke of things others were not willing to speak about. And the response comes from Imam al Hussein, who is the reflection of the school of Amir al Mu'mineen. And this member is dedicated to Rasulullah. This member is dedicated to Islam. This member is dedicated to the Quran. This member is dedicated to Amir al Mu'mineen, but it is known as the member of Imam al Hussein because this member is indebted to the blood of Imam al Hussein. To the sacrifice of Imam al-Hussein. If it wasn't for Imam al-Hussein, we would not be gathered here tonight. So how do we do justice to Hussein on a night like this? We are reminded of his legacy, of his mission, of his vision. He told us the role of this member. We must remain focused, brothers and sisters. Inni lam akhruj ashran, wala batiran, wala مفسدا بل خرجت لإصلاح أمة جدي رسول الله لكي آمر بالمعروف وأنهى عن المنكر وأسير على سيرة جدي وأبي بارك الله بكم إمام الحسين says I did not embark on this journey for fame or popularity or to say that which pleases the people or to make sure I don't you know Displease some people. I embarked on this journey for the sake of perfecting the Ummah, answering its questions, giving it guidance, showing it the way, illuminating its path. And my role model is Rasulullah and my father Amir al Mu'mineen. Amir al Mu'mineen, if you were to describe him in one sentence, as he was described by Khidr on a night like this, on a night like this, Amir al Mu'mineen was taken back to his home. Listen to me carefully. Imam Hassan came out and he said, Amir al Mu'mineen will not be accepting any visitors. Please go. But there was one man there crying. Saluting Amir al Mu'mineen, praising Amir al Mu'mineen. And one of the things that he said, inshallah, we will be speaking about this on the 21st, but one of his sentences was, Wallah, la kana ya'khuduhu fillahi lawmatu la im. He wouldn't care what people thought. All he cared about was Allah. What pleases Allah. That every word that comes out of his mouth is devoted to the cause of the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They asked Al-Imam Al-Hasan, who is this man? We have never seen this man, but he knows Amir al Mu'mineen. He says, that akhuhu al-Khidr. Khidr knows Amir al Mu'mineen. And I tell you, brothers and sisters, every time you see this member, say, please get back on the track of Maytham, get back on the track of Ammar, get back on the track of Amir al Mu'mineen and Imam al Hussein, and talk about relevant issues. If BBC spends several million dollars to defame the school of Ahl al-Bayt using temporary marriage, we should not remain silent. If our youth have to create 20 fake accounts, five different emails, five different Instagram accounts to ask about mut'ah, so they get clarity on temporary marriage, because it's a taboo. 
And the answer they get, what is it? Go take a cold shower, Habibi. Go to Ziyara. Pray Salat al layl Go to the gym. The answers they get, they didn't ask for. The answers they get, they didn't ask for. The, an the questions they ask, they don't get an answer for. And, I, and before I begin discussing this delicate topic, this sensitive topic, I have to say a few words. Number one, that Islam, brothers and sisters, honors the family. The greatest institution within the religion of Islam is the institution of family. Family based on devotion, permanent devotion. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam says Tana kahu tana salu fa inni ubahi bikumul umama yawmal qiyamati walaw Bissiqt Get married, establish families, have children And make me proud on the day of judgment However, consider this brothers and sisters as an emergency door as something placed as a rahmah by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the people. It may not be the norm, but it is there. Don't judge it so quickly. Don't be so close-minded when you come to things that you are ignorant of or you don't know. Like I said, some people, they hate it. Some people, they don't want to talk about it. Some people don't want to discuss it. Of course, there are a few people who want to always discuss it. But the concept is that we have to be open to studying, learning, and understanding the religion of Islam. Number two, while I see, mashallah, the shabab here, and the older shabab as well, mashallah, so eager. I have to give my personal opinion. This is my personal opinion. I could be wrong. I don't believe this is for young adults. I believe that this is for more mature and developed individuals. And I don't believe that this is the solution for everyone. And inshallah, we will keep discussing this as we examine this topic further tonight if you are ready inshallah to recite joshan al-kabir this evening and dua abu hamza and do the a'mal and you are excited to be here i request you to recite three loud salawats ala muhammadin wa ali muhammad اللهم صل على محمد الله سبحانه وتعالى discusses first of all let's outline our discussion number one temporary marriage within the Quran number two temporary marriage within the tafasir of the Sunni school of thought. Unfortunately, we don't have time to examine this topic thoroughly where we look at Sunni tafasir, Shia tafasir. Number three, temporary marriage within the ahadith of the school of Sahaba. Number four, which is very important, temporary marriage practiced by the Sahaba and number five, which is the most important station, the most delicate station, temporary marriage, and our community. Number one. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in chapter four, verse 24, speaks 
of the validity of temporary marriage. Chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa is known as the second Baqarah. Why? Because it is the second largest chapter within the Holy Quran. Now keep this in mind. When was the seven, when was the fourth chapter revealed? The fourth chapter of the Holy Quran, Surah An-Nisa, the woman was revealed seven years after the Hijrah of Rasulullah. So towards the end of the life of Rasulullah. When did it end? When did its dissension end? The tenth year after the Hijrah. In fact, some Sunni ulama, Mufassireen, scholars of tafsir have stated that Ayah 172, known as Ayatul Kalala, was revealed as the very last Ayah within the Holy Quran. So this, the fourth chapter of the Holy Quran, it took approximately three years for it to descend. Seventh year after the tenth year. Why do I say this? Because many people will tell you the ayah of Mut'a has been abrogated, has been changed, the law has been changed. And when you look at the verses that they suggest abrogated, this ayah, you, feel, you see that all of them were revealed prior to this ayah, prior to Surah An-Nisa. So they cannot abrogate. They cannot do naskh of Surah Al-Nisa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here discusses a timed marriage where a man is then required to pay a dowry in return of this marriage, this fixed period of marriage to the woman. Very good. Now let us come to the Mufassireen. The Mufassireen whom have outlined this within their books. And I want you to give me your undivided attention. You see, within Surah An-Nisa, brothers and sisters, since it's the time of the Qur'an, the season of the Qur'an, we are spending time with the Qur'an, and I am extremely proud of this community and the organizers within this community. May Allah bless them as He has blessed them. And may Allah continue to support them as He supported them. How they've dedicated every night to the Holy Qur'an. How many of our communities, brothers and sisters, you find that they have a professional Qur'an reciter who recites the Qur'an in the most beautiful manner, displays eloquence when it comes to reciting the Qur'an so that our youth get to know the Qur'an. Get to experience the Qur'an in this beautiful melody. In fact, this is the duty of every single Islamic institution that belongs to Ahl al-Bayt and adheres to the teachings of Ahl al-Bayt. Wallahi! We don't, this is the primary objective of the month of Ramadan. Rasulullah says, إِنِّي مُخَلِّفٌ فِيكُمُ الثَّقَلَانِ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَعَتْرَتِي آلْ بَيْتِي مَا إِن تَمَسَّكْتُمْ بِهِمَا بِهِمَا لَن تَظِلُّوا بَعْدِ أَبَدًا We must take the Qur'an and the Utra together. We must give as, we give importance to Ahl al-Bayt, we must give importance to the Qur'an. And I hope and I pray that all the communities take the example of this community. Spend some time with the Qur'an, especially the youth. And I'll just say this one hadith. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam says, Ayyama shabbin, once a youth, a young man, a young woman, such as the majority of the people here, spend their youth with the Qur'an. خَالَطَ Quran لَحْمَهُ وَدَمَهُ The Qur'an becomes part of his existence, part of his second nature. He becomes inseparable from the Qur'an. وَكَانَ الْقُرْآنُ لَهُ شَفِيعًا مُشَفَّعًا and the Qur'an then becomes his interceder in this life and in the next life. His guide in this life and in the next life. And this Qur'an, brothers and sisters, this book is alive. This book is not dead. This book can guide you. It can answer your questions. It can bring you happiness and joy. 
It can bring you success. Seek guidance from this Quran. Inshallah, we'll talk about this in the next few nights. The chapter was revealed. Chapter 4 was revealed to abolish many taboos. It's entitled woman. Women didn't, weren't even recognized. Weren't even respected. To talk about family values, to talk about inheritance, to talk about women's rights, to talk about children, to talk about their upbringing, to talk about akhlaq, to talk about morality, to talk about ethics. And one of them is this. A solution for people all around the world. As you, you shall come to see it. And to know it. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. Introduces this marriage in the fourth ayah of. The, the 24th ayah of the fourth chapter. Which ones of the ulama of the muslimin? You see because. They tell you if you ask them what is mut'ah. They tell you it's fornication. It is zina. It is a marriage. Only practiced by the Shia. It is prostitution. Look at the level of ignorance and jahala that some of the Muslims they live in. And there is nobody to question them. Nobody to ask them. We go to their most important book of tafsir. Hands down the most important mufassir of the Sunni school of thought, Muhammad bin Jarir al-Tabari, who died in the year 224. He hails from Tabaristan. And no one, no alim, no Sunni alim can question Tabari. He speaks of the legitimacy of the temporary marriage. And in, the, in this ayah, in the tafsir of this ayah, he speaks of its validity in the time of Rasulullah, in the time of Abu Bakr, and in the time of Umar. Towards the time, the end of the time of Umar. Second, by the way, I'm not speaking of them in chrono chronological order. Order of importance. Of how important those mufassirin are within the Sunni school of thought. And by, by far, they are great mufassirs for the most part. They have rejuvenated the, the science of tafsir. Today, if you go to academia... Those are the main books of tafsir. Number two, Fakhr al-Din al-Razi. Fakhr al-Razi, tafsir Fakhr al-Razi is by far one of the most important books of tafsir within the Muslim world. He is known as Imam al-Mufassirin who died in the year 605 after the Hijrah. Again, he speaks of this and he says, that's the word root mut'ah comes from benefit. A beneficial contract. And it was validified by Rasulullah. Descended onto Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. And practiced by the companions. Number three. Ibn Hazm al-Andulusi. Ibn Hazm al-Andulusi brothers and sisters go read his biography. Some people believe he was Nasabi. He's far away from the madhab of Ahlul Bayt. Certainly he carried a certain animosity for the Rawafid as he calls them. Ibn Hazm al-Andulusi was the founder of Wahhabism. Who died in the year 456 after the Hijrah. And number four, the father of Nawasib. The father of the modern day Wahhabism, Salafism, Ibn Kathir, the teacher of Ibn Taymiyyah, who died in the year 774 after the Hijrah. Every single one of them, when they come to this ayah, they speak of the validity of temporary marriage. So I don't understand how you tell me that this is a form of zina, this is not practiced in Islam, this was not there. It's in the most important books of tafsir. Now, let us come to Bukhari. Sahih Bukhari, not Tariq Bukhari, Sahih Bukhari. Mut'a is mentioned 12 times in Sahih Bukhari. 12 times. In Sahih Muslim, 26 times. 
Ibn Hanbal, 22 times. At-Tirmidhi, 5 times. And I want to read for you what Ibn Hazm al-Andulusi says in his book that will shock you all tonight. In his book, Ibn Hazm al-Andulusi, Al-Muhalla, it's a fiqhi book, Kitab nikah Volume 9, ver, cha, page 519. Listen to this, please. He says, وَقَدْ ثَبَتَ عَلَى تَحْلِيلِهَا He speaks of temporary marriage, and he says, it is a valid, it is halal. بَعْدَ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ جَمَاعَةٌ مِنَ السَّلَفِ وَمِنْهُمْ it was practiced after Rasulullah by some of the companions and amongst them. وَمِنْهُمْ Not all of them. مِنَ sahaba. Which one of the Sahaba? He first begins with Asma bint Abi Bakr al-Siddiq. Asma, the daughter of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, she practiced temporary marriage. And inshallah, I'll speak about the results of the temporary marriage. One of the Imams, one of the great Tabi'eens, was a result of this marriage. أسماء بنت أبي بكر الصديق وجابر بن عبد الله جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري. Those are very important individuals, very important صحابة. Those are not just ordinary صحابة. جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري وابن مسعود وابن عباس عبد الله بن عباس حبر الأمة ومعاوية ابن أبي سفيان. He writes this in his book, Ibn Hazm. وعمر بن حريث وأبو سعيد الخدري وسلمة ورواه جابر بن عبد الله الأنصاري وجمع من الصحابة وكان مدة على زمن أبي بكر وعمر إلى قرب آخر خلافة عمر. So you tell me, who made متع حرام رسول الله عمر? According to him, according to Ibn Hazm al-Andalusi. Umar, I don't know what he was thinking. I don't know why he did this. But we come to the hadith. They went to his son, the second Khalifa's son, Abdullah ibn Umar, who used to practice temporary marriage. And they told him, but your father forbid temporary marriage. How can you practice temporary marriage? He says, because of the witness of my father, I practice it. They say, how? He says, my father said, كَانَتَا عَلَىٰ عَهْدِ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ وَأَنَا أُحَرِّمُهُمَا He was a witness that they existed in the time of Rasulullah. So I take him as a witness. But his ijtihad, I don't follow his ijtihad. How can he have ijtihad when Rasulullah has made it halal? Amongst the very important names in Islam, Abdullah ibn Zubair ibn al-Awwam and Asma ibn Umais. Abdullah ibn Zubair was the product of the temporary marriage by Zubair and Asma ibn Abi Bakr. So this is not something foreign to the religion of Islam or outside the realm of Muslims. If you don't believe in it, if it's not for you, if you don't like it, if you hate it, don't call people who practice it as zunat that this is outside the religion of Islam and accuse them of adultery. And I want to conclude, brothers and sisters. Tonight we have a lot of a'mal. Tonight we have a lot of du'a. We also have the masa'ib of Amir al Mu'minin. But I want to conclude with a few words. Like I said, brothers and sisters, I'm not here to encourage you to do it, to discourage you to do it. But I'm here to speak of certain elements that happen within our community in regards to temporary marriage. And we must talk about this. We must address this. Number one is do not shame those who practice it. Shame those who do haram. Even those who do haram. Who are we to shame people? Shaming in Islam is forbidden. In fact, the hadith says, مَنْ عَيَّرَ مُؤْمِنًا if you come to a mu'min and he's committed a sin and you tell him, Oh, mudak, tayah Allah hadlak, liyash it chisawat, liyash sakhamut wujjak. 
the hadith says you should not do this. You will fall into that sin because you're not in that person's shoes. Do that which Imam al Hussein does with sinners. When Hurr ibn Yazid al Riyahi, the greatest sinner, comes to Imam al Hussein, Imam al Hussein does not shame him. Imam al Hussein takes him by the hand, he raises him. Tubtab Allahu alayk. Tubtab Allahu alayk. Tonight is the night of Tawbah. Imam al Hussein showed Hur that his door of forgiveness and the door of the forgiveness of Allah is open with no shaming. Come within moments. Imam al Hussein showed him the way for repentance. This is for sinners. If people do this, don't shame them. They're not doing something haram. If it's not for you, it's not for you. Why are you shaming people? Why are you going after their reputation? Why are you defaming them? Why are you harassing them? Number two, I see that some people, and remember when I said in the beginning, I feel that this is more for a, a mature, more developed individuals because of the results that I see. Especially the younger sisters. Do not make, not everything halal you must do. Do not make a decision where you will regret later. Be wise in your decisions. Even in permanent marriage, you have to be wise. Where you live, how you live, what you do, what you eat. Even if it's halal, you have to have some wisdom. You have to use the aql that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. Because you may have regrets. Why? Because I have seen blackmailing happen within our community. Don't tell me this has not happened. Where people are blackmailed. They're defamed. A few years ago in the state of California, someone committed suicide because of this. Because of blackmailing. Do you not think of Allah? Do we not think of our qabr? Do we not think of our akhirah? Do we not think of munkar wa nakir when we blackmail people? When we destroy their lives? When we demolish their families? When we take it to social media? And maybe it's not even true. Many of the times it's fabricated lies and we use that to defame people. Isn't this the spirit of Surah An-Nisa? Surah An-Nisa came to talk about social illnesses. Family issues, illnesses within society, and this is one of them. This is one of the illnesses within our society. And number three, do not abuse this. Not everything that is made by... Because many people will tell you this is an ugly act. This is the act of perverted people. Why? Because of the ways that some people abuse it. It is abused. Some people don't even understand its rules. Some people don't even understand its regulations. Go read this al Amaliyah. There is no difference between the laws of permanent marriage and temporary marriage. So when BBC comes and says this is used by the Ethna Asharis as a form of prostitution, it's a lie. And if it is practiced, it is abused by some of the followers. Some of the people who adhere themselves to the madhab of Ahlul Bayt. Imam al Sadiq says, Kunu zaynan lana wa la takunu shaynan alayna. Be an ornament and a decoration upon our name. Not somebody that brings such a terrible reputation for the school of Ahlul Bayt. Don't misuse this. Number, understand its laws. Understand its limitations. And if you're about to get into a contract, know that this is a contract. You can limit the usage of this contract. And lastly, I want to say this. Our journey begins tonight to discuss extremely relevant and sensitive topics. And we choose to make that as a form of our allegiance to the member of Amir al muminin to the legacy of Amir al muminin to create awareness within our community, to create awareness within our youth, to perfect, insha'Allah, the ummah of Amir al muminin صلوات الله وسلامه عليه
And know, brothers and sisters, that the hurma of a mu'min, the hurma of a mu'min, I'll say this and inshallah I'll go towards the holy city of Najaf and Kufa and the shrine of Amir al Mu'mineen. The hurma of a mu'min, the dignity of a mu'min, the nobility of a mu'min, the reputation of a mu'min, the name of a mu'min is more sacred to Allah than the what? Kaaba. The Kaaba. Can you spit at the Kaaba? Can you? So, similarly, don't do that to a mu'min. A mu'mina. On a night like this, Amir al Mu'mineen was in the house of his daughter Zainab. Zainab al Kubra. She says the maqtal of Amir al Mu'mineen. She narrates this night to us. Are you ready to travel to the house of Amir al Mu'mineen? Wa Mawla al Muhadeen. Asadullah wa Asadu Rasulih. وارث المشعرين وأبو السبطين من حارب بين يدي رسول الله بسيفين وضرب برمحين وهاجر الهجرتين ولم يشرك بالله طرفة عين يعسوب المؤمنين وتاج البكائين وأول المسلمين وأصبر الصابرين she says I came and I put some salt and some bread and some milk in front of him. This was the iftar of Amir al Mu'mineen on a night like this. He said, he looked at me and he said, Ya Zainab, when have you seen me to eat two kinds of food? He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, this is not two kinds of food. He says, Zainab, take one of them away. Allah. And then he said, Uridu an alqa rabbi wa ana faragul 